Hello and welcome to SETI Live. I'm your host, Beth Johnson, communication specialist here at the SETI Institute. Thank you to all of our viewers from around the world for joining us. Please let us know where you are watching from. And also welcome to listeners on the podcast version of SETI Live, which is available on most podcast platforms. So today I have with us Institute Postdoctoral Fellow, Ariel Grykowski, who works uh, with on the Unistellar Citizen Science Project. And this is really cool because you guys are getting images of comets, which of course, comets are amazing. They, everybody is fascinated by them. We're always looking for the next big comet. Um, so what, tell us about, about comet hunting. What, what inspires you when it comes to comets? Let's start there. Yeah, sure. Uh, so yeah, most of my research revolves around comets um, pretty much solely. Um, and it really is that just kind of wonder about them. They have this activity due to sublimation where when they get hot, their ices sublimate, turn into gases, and that's how you get those iconic tails, essentially. Mm -hmm. But every comet acts a little bit differently, and it might depend on how big that comet is, or where the comet came from originally, um, or things that we don't under understand yet. And there's a saying that comets are like cats, they do as they please. Um, and it's just really true. And it just makes you want to study each and every single one to understand, is this one gonna be like something I've seen before or not? What, what is it gonna do when it comes around? So I think that's why I'm particularly interested in comets. Do you remember what the first like major one you saw with the unaided eye was? Oh yeah, so the first one I saw without a telescope or binoculars or anything was Neowise. And I think that was the summer of 2020, if I remember correctly. Um, and yeah, that was just super cool. I had to adjust my eyes a little bit to the night sky, but very quickly and just in a suburban area, I was able to see a, the long tail and everything. So that was awesome. That's really neat. I, I remember uh, Hale Bop and pulling over to the oh. side of the road up in the uh, Colorado Rockies and, and actually like getting out of the car and just sort of like standing there and looking at it. And it was, it was phenomenal. And I know oh, that's cool. I, I know that's like one of the brightest ones we've had in the last, you know, decades, but it's so, it was such a neat thing to see. So to that point, one of the things that I've sort of noticed about comet research in the last, you know, couple decades is that we have all of these amazing observatories now that you know soho which is is orbiting the, the you know sun and is taking pictures of the sun and catches all these like comets as they come in we've got linear and atlas and iras and all of these one these observatories that are really designed to like catch the night sky and find near earth asteroids but they find comets about you know pretty often as well and neo is of course on that list too um but we don't obviously you know we've seen comets for centuries. This is, you know, thousands of years, honestly, they, they were known as signs and portents of dark things to come. Then we have records of them dating back millennia, but you guys at Unistellar, the, the citizen science are finding that you can now see them with your telescopes earlier than we obviously can with say like our, our you know, binoculars, unaided eye which I think is amazing. So tell us a bit about how this is sort of like developed. How did this citizen science aspect on, of Unistellar's um, citizen science develop? Yeah, sure. So in particular, Unistellar citizen science, there's a few different programs. And so obviously I run the Comet program. Um, and in particular with that program, our goal is to monitor comets over time. Um, and so it really is that like trying to understand why their activity is the way it is and can we mm -hmm. track it and can we predict it and to do that we have to be constantly looking at co a comet as it's moving through its orbit and so having a network of telescopes across the world which we have with these unicellular EV scopes is the perfect tool to do it um, every night somebody's looking at one of the comets on our mission list um, which is awesome because we can add a data point to a curve where we're mm -hmm. saying it's this bright and we think it's going to be this bright in the future. Um, so really it's, it's the fact that we have this large network that we're able to utilize 
to make this as a tool to make these predictions and to understand cometary activity over long periods of time. And um, what we found is also has been a really great use is finding ephemeral events like outbursts. So basically we can kind of predict how comets are gonna change over time based on things that we already know, but sometimes comets get super bright all of a sudden. Maybe they got hit by another asteroid or comet or something, um, or they're spinning too fast and they start to break up and they just spew a bunch of stuff. Um, we saw that with the DART mission, for example, that was an outburst due to an impact. It got super bright. Um, and so comets will do this sometimes uh, and we wanna know why. Um, and so it's really important to catch those events when they happen. So again, having this large network that's observing regularly really helps us catch those outbursting events and figure out what are the physics behind this event. So one of the things that I think is kind of fascinating here is that, you know, you guys can look at, at comets basically as soon as someone else discovers them. Um, and then to your point that, you know, all of this data is getting recorded you can kind of go back and see if people have seen it in the in previous data, correct? Yes, yeah, um, we can definitely do that. We also, with the unicellular EV scopes, they are small scopes. Um, and so we, in general, we don't really start a mission or tell anybody to look at a certain object until it's at least 15 magnitudes um, on this magnitude scale um, or brighter, um, but, with some of these comets, we wanna monitor them for a much longer period of time. So we wanna say, hey, can we actually see this comet sooner than we thought in this data? And so we've been able to do that. And um, we're, we've been impressed and surprised with how faint we can see with the EV scopes. Right, so you, you did you present this information at the AAS meeting? Is that is that my understanding or did you? This um, was in a research note okay. um, and that's all so far, so yeah. Okay, so this research note talks about two particular comets that were um, recently discovered. So we have uh, Comet 12P, which is Pons Brooks. Okay, not recently discovered. And we have Comet 2023 A3, and I'm, I'm going to uh, Sunishen Atlas. So can you really quickly, for everybody watching, explain how comets are named? <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah, sure. So the naming scheme, it, it kind of depends on if it's a periodic comet. So if it comes around, you know, um, several times, or if it's uh, a comet that is basically on a much longer orbit where maybe it's going to be ejected or it's going to take quite a bit more time for it to come around again. Um, sometimes the naming gets mixed up until we really nail the orbit down. So some sometimes you see a comet with a name that doesn't really fit those categories, but you basically end up with like a 12P if it's like a short period comet, a number P. Um, so typically if I see 2P, something P, I, I know, oh, it's a short period comet. It's gonna have an orbit of like 15 plus or minus five years or something in general. It's just kind of how I think about it. Um, with the other naming scheme, it's a little, um, there's some rigidness to it, like C 2023 A3, uh, and then Su Chin Chan Atlas. The name part, the words part, is named after the discoverer. Um, so oftentimes it's the name of an observatory, um, which it is in this case. And then the, the part before that, you have C for comet, and essentially, and um, the year it was discovered, 2023. And then the letter represents the month and which half of the month. So A is the first half of January, and then the last number of three is the third comet discovered in the first half of January in 2023. I do like that they still allow us, you know, allow people to name, be, have them be named after the people who found them. Um, you know, I, I, I've worked in meteor showers and the naming scheme there is basically where it is in the sky. Uh. So I when I when I found my first meteor shower and, and all my friends were like, do you get to name it? It's like, well, kind of, but not anything exciting. It's just going to be named about the radiant point. So. Um, all right. So you have these two comets. They were they were discovered. Obviously, 2023 was discovered last year in January. So this one's only been visible for about a year. Um, what. How does how do you send these notifications out to your citizen science network? And then what sort of 
observations do you get back? So we have a couple ways to kind of inform our network. Our main way is the Unicellular website. Um, we basically, we have a comment missions page where I list the comments that we're focusing on at the moment. Um, and then if you go to that web page, you could see, and then you can use our prediction tool, um, which will give you a link that if you click on it, it'll take you to your telescope and help your telescope point straight to the comet. So very like thoughtless, you can just say what's going on. I wanna look at that. Can I look at that right now? Yes, click, go. Um, so that's our main way. We also have a Slack platform that any citizen astronomer with an EV scope can join um, where a lot more discussion happens there. And so I'll sometimes prompt them like, you know, we haven't seen this in a while or something cool just happened. Can somebody look at this? And somebody usually looks at it pretty quickly, um, which is fun. And they share pictures there and motivate each other to keep observing. And so they observe, they do like 20 to sometimes an hour long observation of a comet. I get a bunch of images in and then I stack them and measure how bright basically. Okay. And so we have these two comets, we've sent out the notifications and you got data back. And that's what this research note talks about. And, and again, one of the, the, the really key point here is that these EV scope telescopes can catch these comets at a lower magnitude than we thought. And by lower magnitude, I think the paper says minus six, or is it, is it like 16? Is that it? Yeah, we found in this study that we were able to detect uh, the faintest comet we detected in the sample was 16.7 magnitudes. Um, and that's to like a one sigma um, level. Okay. So if you know the lingo, then you know the lingo. But basically, we can detect things that are uh, fainter than we thought. We thought we could go to 15 about without really doing much of a study, but we can go even fainter to 16.7, which is unintuitive because the magnitude scale is reversed. But that's fainter. Yeah, let's we'll we'll get to the magnitude scale. I'm going to welcome in some people because I I realized that I have not done that. I'm sorry, everyone. Um, uh, we have people watching from Colorado, Poland, Scotland, the UK, uh, Florida, Budapest, uh, Brazil, um, Pacific Northwest, Louisiana. Uh, what else we got here? Yes. Okay. So that's, that's a pretty good mix of viewers. Thank you again for watching this. Um, all right, let's talk about this magnitude scale so that the audience kind of has an understanding about what this is. It is very counterintuitive um, for those of us who have done astronomy for a while. Even I still have, I still struggle with it. Um, can you explain why a 16.7 magnitude is fainter than a 15 magnitude? Because again, this, this is not, this is very counterintuitive. Yeah, yeah, it is very counterintuitive. But um, basically, it's just we met. It's easier to think about comets and anything in the sky in astronomy in terms of flux. And so, if I ever do start getting confused about the reverse, if I'm like making a correction, for example, sometimes I add when I need to subtract because I'm not thinking about it properly. Um, so, you can always just go back to flux how many photons are coming in and more more photons is brighter um but it is it is flipped when you convert it to this magnitude scale uh, which is also logarithmic so if you go from let's say a, a magnitude of 16 mags and the comet brightens to a 15 mag um that's it brightening two and a half times if it goes from 16 to 11 so five mags in brightness that would be a uh, hundred times in brightness increase. So um, yeah, the, the, the magnitude scale is just weird. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so it's, it's almost more logarithmic, um, yeah. sort of like the, the uh, moment magnitudes for earthquakes, if you think about it that way. But yeah. weirdly reversed, I, I think one of the things is that they started with, uh, what, Venus, I think, and then they worked fainter was a higher number. So like Venus is like one and then, but then they found things that could be like brighter and then those became like negatives and it gets yeah. very strange. So um, if you, yeah. if you want to get into this, that 
it's a thing you'll have to understand and it's it's really weird okay yeah so the sun for example is negative 27 i think yeah which is like okay <laughs> right exactly i mean it's it's wild yeah okay so um let's let's get back to the results you mm -hmm. have given me some pictures so i want to um, oh, yeah show the audience here so these are the two comets we're talking about what what is the magnitude that we're we're looking at here because i i'm impressed that you can tell that there's a comet there on either one of these so yeah honestly it the human eye in identifying patterns and identifying things in general i think is one of the best tools in the world um, I was able to, I, I stack these images all on top of each other on top of the comet itself. And comets are moving objects relatively in the sky, unlike stars. So that's why you see in the left image, the stars are all streaked um, mm -hmm. because of the movement of the comet, essentially. Um, so when I stacked them, I opened it up, I started stretching the scale and I was able to see it right away. Um, and then you have to start taking uh, these flux measurements, these magnitude measurements, uh, and you have to really determine what that aperture size is going to be so you're not drowning out the result with noise. Because when you start doing that, you make an aperture too big, it gets so noisy that basically, based on the numbers you're getting, there's nothing there at all. Um, mm -hmm. So you have to be able to find where that peak is and really hone in on that peak in, in flux on this image. Um, to do it. But yeah, they are super faint. The, here, I, th I believe A3 is about 16.7 and 12P is close to it. Okay. Yeah. So this is this is basically, this is the, right now, as far as you know, the limit of the telescope. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, this is what we know right now. Um, but I, this was a smaller study. So we do want to expand it to see how it varies to with what Bortle class you're in, for example. So if you're in a city versus if you're in no city at all, you know, if you're in a really dark sky area, um, can you see deeper? Um, that's something we'd like to quantify further because maybe we could see a little bit fainter if you're in a really dark sky area. And you did track the Bortle on all of these. So Bortle is yeah. just a, another one of these weird numbers that basically is, it's a scale that, that says how dark your night sky is, right? Mm -hmm. So how, how much light pollution impacts where you are viewing from. And you did track this with um, all of the data that you got on these two. And and from what I understand, you didn't really find too much of a difference between, I think I think the range I saw was about Bortal 4 to Bortal 8. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And we didn't see too much of a difference. But um, yeah, again, I think we looked at, I'm trying to even remember, six different images or so. Um, and so we didn't want to say it for sure. It doesn't depend on Bortle right. class. In my mind, it must at least a bit. Um, but we did not see a trend in that study. That's for sure. So you need more data points. Um, so if you if you have a, an EV scope, hey, <laughs> <laughs> um, participate in these citizen science projects. That's like the best thing about, I mean, the unicellular EV scopes are amazing, but seriously, citizen science part of it is kind of, the part that always makes me happy. Um, so, how much, how much more data do you, how big a study do you want? Like, how, what are we talking here? What, what's the, what's the current capability of the network? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, I don't know. <laughs> I think it would be awesome to have at least a few observations from each Bortle class uh, of a faint comet in like a month period or so. I think that would be a possible thing if, if that was a mission that we set out to do and told everyone to do it. This was more like uh, these two comets kind of motivated us to start being like, OK, we want to see fainter than we think we can. Can we? Um, so we didn't have a set out mission to see exactly how faint we can go. Um, but yeah, these two comets were kind of special and they triggered this motivation to do this. So I just kind of want to go through some of the the images you sent me, and maybe we can talk about these a little bit. So um, yeah. this is this is sort of what you're saying. Uh, A three looks like now. Yeah. So this is an example of like what our pipeline pushes out essentially when you observe um, and upload your data. 
our pipeline will push out a little graphic like this where, where you'll see some information about the comet, a picture of it, um, and what we measured for its magnitude. So in the very, very center there, that's A3. So it's looking, you know, a little brighter, just, you know, by eye visually than the last image we showed, but it's still pretty faint. Um, but this comet is particularly interesting because it's going to be a very, very bright comet at the end of this year. And so that's why we wanted to start tracking it right away. And so actually when it was discovered in early January last year, I was kind of, and it, I was kind of like, okay, cool, another comet. But then like, as observations rolled in, the predictions started rolling in and we knew that it was going to be super bright at the end of this year. And um, I started to get jealous because it was too faint, I thought, for the unicellular network to look at. And so I was like, well, maybe we can, I don't know. And so I just asked them on Slack, like, hey, if you guys can look at this, that'd be nice. It's really faint, so I don't know if we'll see anything. Um, so they looked at it in April and they did, they saw it right away. And so I, I was really stoked about that. So I was like, okay, um, that was our first indicator. We can see fainter than we thought, which is good for this prediction, um, mm -hmm. essentially. So, uh, so when you're, when you're talking about the, the brightness of predictions, this is what you're talking about. This sort of, yeah. of these graphs that, that it's like collect as much data as possible and then sort of like try to make these sort of bright peak when this is going to happen. And so this is what the, the data that you guys have uh, received from people looking at Comet A3 are telling you. Yeah, that's what this is. And so we have this cluster of data points here in the early area. And then there, you see a gap and then we have more data points. Um, so actually the data points after the gap, that's our pipeline being able to do it on its own. Um, and then we have this cluster beforehand that I've been able to work on now that I've put out this research note. Now that we know that we could see fainter than we thought we could and we can measure fainter than we thought we could. Um, so I've been going back um, into the archives and redoing these measurements um, now that we can do them and adding them in. So there's a bit of a gap. There's a bit of a gap for the reason that I haven't finished, but also because it was not observable for a period of time in that gap as well. Um, but it's been nice to add these data points in and fit this curve better. Mm -hmm. um, so we can more accurately determine how bright is it going to be. Okay. Um, let's see. So this is a little bit more close up. So you can yeah. kind of see the, the error bars. Um, oh, explain this one. This one's a good one. Oh, yeah. Okay. So basically... What we predict is that this comet is going to be around magnitude zero, negative one-ish. Um, I think our, that plot shows negative one um, during perihelion um, and close approach, which is September 27th is perihelion and October 12th mm -hmm. is close approach. And so with that's very exciting. That's a very bright comet. You can think of other things in our sky, like uh, the brightest star Sirius is like... Um, I wrote it down, see, yeah, negative 1.4. So it'll be like on the order of brightness of the star Sirius. Nice. Um, Jupiter is like negative three absolute max. Um, this is, it'll be pretty bright. It'll be naked eye for sure. Um, okay. But there's good news and bad news about its apparition. Uh, the good news being forward scattering. So that's what this is showing here. So at the time, this comet is going to be so close to the sun that it's within Earth's orbit. So basically, it's going to be backlit by the sun. Okay. And dust does some weird stuff with light called forward scattering. Uh, basically, instead of casting a shadow, it will cast a shadow, but it won't just cast a shadow. Um, as the light interacts with the dust particles, the dust particles will prefer preferentially scatter that light forward in, back into our eyes, um, back to Earth, essentially. So what this means is that with forward scattering, it, this comet will be even brighter than we predict right now, probably. How much? That's going to really depend on how much dust this comet ends up producing. Um, mm -hmm. And we're still like in early times um, to really know that for sure. It's going to depend on how much dust versus gas is in the comet, things like that. So there's still a lot of mystery around this. Um, 
but we're thinking it's going to be even brighter than we think, basically, <laughs> due to this effect. Okay, that's that's really interesting to know. That was that was an aspect I was not aware of here. And then yeah. oh, this is just pretty. <laughs> it's pretty, and I wanted to show it because it, it's a good example of forward scattering that we've seen in the past. That's kind of comparable to what this comet's going to be. So this okay. is Comet McNaught, and this came around to perihelion in 2007. So if anyone in the chat saw this one, let me know. I didn't see it. That's really sad for me. <laughs> um, but it was an amazing, amazingly bright comet. It got up to about negative. Um, here, I say negative 5.5. I also saw reports of negative 6 in brightness, and it was predicted to be about negative 2. Um, so that's four magnitudes brighter than it was predicted to be, and that's due to this forward scattering effect. Um, you could see it clearly here where you could still see some light on the horizon, and the crescent moon is in this picture, and this comet mm -hmm. is super bright. Um, so it's kind of a comparable situation potentially um, okay. to what we might see. That's that's actually really exciting. I sadly did not get to see this comment either. Um, <clears throat> I had a, a toddler, <laughs> so my, <laughs> my time was not my own. Um, actually, at January 2007. Oh, no, I had a baby. <laughs> <laughs> so well, yeah, no, true. I was I was not I was not going anywhere to see anything at that point. Um, okay, I want to take a couple audience questions because we are getting kind of towards the end here. So, um, okay. is there, is this, this is what it looks like? Okay. Yeah, this is just, you could see it with the sun out. I thought that was pretty cool. That I is... do want to quickly give the bad news though, and that okay. is that this comet is going to have a really low solar elongation uh, when it's at perihelion, which means it's going to be close to the sun, kind of like in this picture where you're going to have to really chase the comet. Um, depending on when you're looking, either as the sun is setting or right before the sun rises. Um, you're not going to have a large window to look at it during perihelion, but it, it, still, it looks like we might be able to still see it pretty well, even though it'll be drowned out um, by the sunlight. But that's something to keep in mind. So we have effects that are going to make it look fainter and look brighter. Mm -hmm. They might cancel out. You're going to have to try hard to see it too. <laughs> Oh my gosh. So it's a little bit complicated on this. Our, our relationship with this comet is complicated. Yeah. Okay. Um, so a couple, one of the questions that I, I really like here, because I, I feel like this is, is it, it's, it's honestly, it's a, it's a big question in, in astronomy anyway. Um, Nikki's asking, is it easy to tell apart asteroids from comets? Ooh, that's a good question. Um, visually, most of the time, but not always. So just visually, when we're taking pictures of comets and asteroids, if we're taking pictures of comets like these faint ones before they really kick on their sublimation, so they don't, they're not fuzzy, they don't have a tail yet, um, they are just a rock in the sky, uh, essentially, which so is an asteroid. And so they look just almost like a little star in the sky. They both look the same. When a comet starts to kick on its sublimation, it becomes fuzzy. Um, and that becomes obvious to the eye. It also, you can measure the amount of fuzz basically on the image, um, how much that fuzz is spreading out, it can be measured. Um, and typically asteroids don't do that because they have less ices. However, they ha don't have zero ices. And so there are ways to activate asteroids as well. Um, so they can also do the same thing. They'll start to sublimate and become fuzzy and make tails as well. Um, and so what you really need is the orbit. Um, so you need several um, observations so you can track the orbit and say, this one's orbiting in this way. That means it belongs to this population, which is the asteroid population, the main belt, let's say, or this mm -hmm. is orbiting this way. That means it came from the Kuiper belt. That's a comet, for example. Okay. Um, and I won't even, I'm not even gonna get into centaurs. Uh... Yeah. <laughs> Let's let's not that, do that to ourselves or our audience. Okay, uh, Brasa Space is asking: Are you using any sort of AI to help pick candidate data or imagery, Ooh, or are you yeah. just going through this by hand? Uh, yeah, no AI. I think that we're definitely are moving in that way, though, and I probably should try some AI. I think that's a good idea um, to see if I can help. It can help me pick these out. Um, 
like I said, by eye has been really, really helpful. Um, but that is also an excellent way to train an AI, right? So I, by eye, I can have some 100%, I know this is true, give it to the AI, have it learn with that, and then maybe it can start doing it too. But I think it'll take, obviously, some double checking for a little while until it can do it by itself. I think that's a great idea is to start implementing these things into looking for these patterns for us. Okay, so some so you'll need some programming and some training on the AI to get it to do what you want it to do, but it, it's a good candidate for that kind of technology, so. Yeah, I think so. I like that, all right. Um, I'm gonna, I'm, all right. Uh, <laughs> French Stud is asking, is there a website for the public to find and analyze candidates? Oh, um, so, you know, for, I do believe there is an active asteroid uh, campaign, a citizen science campaign through NASA, where you can help go through images and I, and find uh, active asteroids. I don't remember what the program is called, but you can search like NASA active asteroids. There's definitely places where you can do things like this, where you're, you're helping them find the fuzziness of that asteroid because they really want to identify more active asteroids. Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, and and probably uh, the best place to go for that would be Zooniverse. Um, that's where NASA hides a lot of their, I don't want to say hide, but that's where a lot of the citizen science projects are run out of. So yeah, okay. um, yeah, you, can always right. take a universe. Look, you can always take a look over there. Um, yeah. And then, and then finally, just because it amuses me, uh, Will X is asking, what do you think of Hollywood films like Deep Impact and Armageddon? They're not comets, but is that kind of thing possible? Uh, technically, it's possible. Um, I have to say that. I, I think we'll definitely catch it in time before. Um, there's estimations on how likely something like that is to happen, and the likelihood is basically zero at this point. Uh, yeah. So it's possible, it's not gonna happen. We have so many telescopes uh, in, in space, on the ground, constantly scanning the sky at this point, mm -hmm. uh, where we have a, a really good idea of where everything that's big is. Sometimes a little one gets by us, so we get the surprise uh, like meteor, really bright meteor that we didn't see coming. Um, sometimes they could be a little bit destructive, like every, 10, 20 years or so, um, but nothing crazy. Um, but anything bigger than that, we've got our eyes on. Okay. Which actually, I, I'm gonna wrap it up with this last question from the audience, then I'll ask you a final question. Um, Nikki also asked, can you spot comets that are coming from the direction of the sun? Because I know that's uh, a problem we have with with meteors and asteroids as well, so. Yeah, no, you... same, same problem, same okay. problem. <laughs> so. No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but but at the same time we do have we do have things like SOHO, which is observing the sun directly and sees a lot of those things. So yeah, definitely, and we surveys have been going on for a while now, and they can will continue to. And so again, like if if there's something big out there that ends up getting uh, knocked towards us, ho hopefully we have a track on it before it gets blocked by the sun. You know, um, right. these surveys are long term. Okay, that's and that's that's really good. Um, okay, so I think we're kind of at the end. Uh, my final question, of course, is what are you working on next, or is this still sort of what's on your table? Yeah, kind of this. And so, like, what we I really want to do with this is to automate it into our pipeline essentially, um, choosing these aperture sizes based on how faint a comet is versus how bright it is and how big it is on the image can be really tricky. Um, and so that's kind of the trickiest thing that we, we've we faced with the pipeline so far, but like learning things, this like how faint we can go and how we can, how, we're, how we measure that faint comet to the most accuracy is gonna really help me improve that pipeline. Um, and then the same, the other way around for really bright comets too. So automating that into our pipeline is a big deal for me right now and using this to go back and look at other comments that we've looked at already. Well, Ariel, thank you for joining me today. And I, I wish you luck with this. This is this is really neat. And I really love that you guys, the, the, the citizen science team is is able to see these comments at a fainter point than we thought. Um, 
And uh, I, this is really neat. I wish I had an EV scope. <sighs> if anybody yeah, wants to like, you know, <laughs> put that on my wish list. Thanks. Um, yeah. All right. Thank you again for being here. Thank you everybody for watching. Um, my name is Beth Johnson. This has been Ariel Gronkowski and uh, we are with the SETI Institute, which is a nonprofit uh, organization dedicated to searching for uh, life and understanding life in the universe. And, and everything in the universe kind of goes with that. So um, we will be here again next week. I am actually going to um, talk to uh, Peter Yeniskins next week about um, meteorites, particularly the one that was recently um, discovered in Berlin, so, or outside of Berlin. So very excited to talk about that one. And um, we will see you all next week. Thank you for watching us. Thank you again, Ariel. Yeah, thank you.